Go ahead and turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. We'll give our worship team a chance to sit down and everybody a chance to turn there this morning. My microphone's on, right? Yep, we're good. Okay. So, <laughs> Patty, you don't have a duck walk. It's okay. I don't think the camera would pick you up. It'd be all right. Well, this morning's message is titled, The Messiah's Mercy. And if you have picked up your Bible throughout the week and, and looked ahead, you have seen the story is that of a man named Bartimaeus. He's a blind man who encounters Jesus and his life is never the same. And so this morning we're going to begin reading in verse 46. It says, And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus... A blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. I'm going to pray again. Father God, I just pray that this passage pierce our hearts, that we understand what you're saying to us today, the example that Bartimaeus is for us. And, and Father God, I pray that we grasp the goodness of your mercy and that we too call out to Jesus, the Son of David, our Messiah, our King, with desperation, with passion, and with love for him, for who he is and for what he's done for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. We don't often like to talk about mercy. We love to talk about so many other things about God and things God does and things God is and all that, but mercy is one of those things. It's if you really think about it, it's not talked about nearly as often as all the other things. But the mercy of Christ, and if you're taking notes and you want to write this down, if you're at home, the one thing I hope you take away from this message today is that the mercy of Christ is worth losing everything else. I'll say that again: the mercy of Christ is worth losing everything else. Now, we read this story, and if we are in Christ, if we are Christians, if the Holy Spirit dwells within us, the Spirit of Christ is in us, and we are in him, then we are seeing take place in this text a very familiar story. It's one I've quoted often the last six months or so. It goes something like this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. This is our story as much as it is Bartimaeus's. That's not to say we are Bartimaeus, but Bartimaeus is an example for us in how he cries out for Christ's mercy. Like I said, mercy is an incredible word. We think about grace, we think about love, we think about faith, but mercy tends to be pushed to the side or to the back. We see it in the Old Testament, we see it in the New. Typically, we understand it to mean to have pity. It's an attribute, it's an attribute of God that is rooted in God's love. But when we begin to study it, when we begin to understand the gravity of that word, well, mercy takes a whole new form. When we look at the Old Testament, the Hebrew word rahim is a word that often is translated mercy, but also gets translated compassion. Isaiah 14.1 says, when the Lord will have compassion 
or mercy on Jacob. And again, choose Israel and put them in their own land. Then sojourners will join them and attach themselves to the house of Jacob. There's another Hebrew word, anotai. I think I'm pronouncing that right, anotai. And it also gets translated as mercy, sometimes as graciousness or just, just gracious. We see it in Exodus 33, 19, when God says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And it's from this Old Testament concept of God's nature and God's mercy that is rooted in God's love that the Apostle Paul begins to build his case for God's mercy. When he writes things like he says to the Ephesians, he says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. He writes to Titus, he says, concerning mercy, he says, He saved us not by works which we did in righteousness, but according to his mercy. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. You understand, when we pray that prayer of salvation, that sinner's prayer, or whatever the case may be, whenever you surrender your life to God, you are casting yourself upon the mercy of God. It is his mercy that allows salvation to be possible. We are asking him for that. Now, we often talk about mercy and, and what it is and what it does, and we define it usually alongside grace. We say mercy is not receiving what we do deserve and grace is getting what we don't deserve. And that's why we don't like mercy. Because if we were honest about that, if we, if we carry that to the fullest extent of what we're really saying there, mercy is we don't get the wrath that we do deserve. Instead, we are washed in God's grace and love and mercy and given what we don't deserve, when his wrath passes from us and on to Christ on the cross, that is his mercy. The Presbyterian R.C. Sproul, he said this, grace and mercy are never deserved. And that's very true because if they were deserved, they would not be grace and mercy, they would be justice. And if we're real, if we're honest, if we're blunt, we do not want God's justice. Because we are sinful, we have wronged, we have done unholy things in our life. But we desperately need his mercy so that that justice then falls upon Christ on the cross. And when God sees us now through the blood of his son, he sees the purity of his son. And when he looks upon Christ on the cross, he sees your sin. That is his mercy at work. We read again in verse 46, And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And we'll just stop right there. Who is they? This is, that's one of the common questions, right? They're out to get me. They're rigging the election. They're doing this. They're doing that. We always say, well, who is they? Right? Right? They, in this sense, is the same crowd and probably more who have gathered around Jesus since verse 1 of chapter 10 when he set out initially to head towards Jerusalem. And so he's headed this way and the, the crowd that has been with him, the 12 disciples, the rest of those who have sat under his teaching and the pilgrims who are heading towards Jerusalem for the, for the week of Passover, they are following him. And he enters this town called Jericho. And Mark does something very interesting here. He says, they came to Jericho and they were leaving Jericho. He's very quick there. There's a lot that might have happened in Jericho. And Mark says, meh, we're just going to move on. We're just going to pretend that nothing really happened. Luke gives us some more insight. Now in Mark, we do see Jesus runs into this guy named Bartimaeus, this blind man. Luke also sheds some light and says he also ran into another man, a wee little man named Zacchaeus. How many of you know that story, that song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he, right? Well, he climbs up in a sycamore tree for the Savior he wanted to see. Both of these men, both Bartimaeus and Zacchaeus, were lost men. 
And they are both examples to us in their own right. Bartimaeus is a man who pleads for mercy, who casts himself upon the mercy of Christ. And Zacchaeus is an example of true repentance and accepting the grace of God. This all takes place in Jericho. These few handfuls of words that Mark uses and doesn't tell us much more, all of this takes place in that time. In fact, we know that Jesus stays the night in Jericho because he tells Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today, right? That's the way I remember the little poem, little song. And he does. He stays the night in Jericho. But the point is, he's not staying very long, and we'll get back to that in a moment. But when we look at this story, and we begin to unpack it, and we look at it in light of the other synoptic gospels, Matthew and Luke, it seems very interesting to me. It's almost as if the scripture is contradicting itself, and we need to unpack that. We need to address that. Matthew says there were two blind men, and that's a problem we're going to address. But he also says they were leaving Jericho. Well, Mark also says he was leaving Jericho, that he came to Jericho and ran into Bartimaeus as he was leaving. Luke says it's one unnamed blind man, but he runs into him as he's approaching Jericho. Now, to understand this, we have to understand the way the Gospels were written. They were written, Matthew was, of course, an eyewitness to this entire thing. Mark likely got his story from Peter. And Luke went back and investigated and asked as many people as he could to get the idea of what happened. So the real conclusion we can run to is that this did actually happen. This is an actual historical event. In fact, you can go and find the city of Jericho today. So we know at least the location is a real place. And when police officers are investigating a crime scene and they call together witnesses, they do this thing where the witnesses each tell their own story. One person might say, well, the guy had a gun, he shot this other guy, and he was, the guy who had the gun was wearing a red shirt. The second guy comes along and says, well, I saw him shoot a guy and he was wearing a blue hat. Well, which was it? Was he wearing a blue hat or a red shirt? Well, the point of the matter is the guy got shot, Right? That's what the police officer is really looking for. And he might be looking for a man with a red shirt and a blue hat, both. This tells the police officer that the witnesses did not collude to frame somebody. If all the Gospels told the same story the exact same way every single time, we would say there was collusion. They were reading from the same script, and therefore their testimony becomes invalid. In fact, the courts would not take that testimony. They wouldn't accept that, or it would become suspect. So that's why when we read this and we see different points of view to the same story, it's very important to us. This tells us, above all things, this really happened. There were witnesses who had slightly different stories, but the fact of the matter is Bartimaeus got his sight back. Okay, He pled for the mercy of Christ. Jesus stopped and listened to him and touched him and healed him, and all these, all these things are true. But we also look at it this way, and we have to understand, Jericho was a city 15 miles northeast of Jerusalem. It was about five miles from the Jordan River. It's actually very close to the area where Jesus was tempted by Satan back in chapter 1 and Matthew 4 and Luke 4. And it was a cursed city, of course, we know that. I call it a cursed city because Josephus tells us it was always hot. It was always warm. Even when there was snow in Jerusalem, in Jericho, all the people would need to wear were light linens to stay warm because Jericho was always hot. Now, that's not why it's really a cursed city. That's just because I don't like the heat. Okay, that's why I live in North Dakota where the wind hurts my face. It's, I, I don't like hot weather. But we do know it was a cursed city because in Joshua 6.26, Joshua himself, the successor of Moses, after the walls of Jericho had come tumbling down, after Rahab had joined Israel, Joshua curses the city of Jericho. And he says that whoever decides to try and rebuild this city, when they pour the foundation, it's going to cost them the life of their oldest son. So when they begin pouring the city, they're going to lose their oldest son. And he says, when they lift the gates, that will cost them the life of their youngest son. Now we fast forward to 1 Kings 16. There's this man named Hiel the Bethelite, and Abiram is his oldest son. And as he pours the foundation for the new Jericho, he loses his son. 
And as he lifts the gates, his youngest son, a man named Sagub, he dies as well. So this makes the territory of Jericho a little smudgy too. This makes it a little different. You have the old ruins, right? And you have new Jericho, in a sense. Not to mention, you also have the fact the Persians, the Babylonians, etc., the Romans, others have come in and they've no doubt ransacked that city. They've burned it to the ground or they've raised it, however you want to say it. They've tore down this city. They've rebuilt this city probably a few times by now. And so the territory begins to be, like I said, a little smudgy. And so what most people conclude is that Matthew and Mark are talking about Jesus entering or leaving the Old Testament ruins and entering into New Jericho, where Luke is strictly saying he is entering into the, what the New Testament reader would understand to be modern day at that point, that point Jericho. But the point is, like I said before, Jesus is not staying long in this city. He's in and out. He stayed the night with Zacchaeus, and he's moving on. If you remember the last few weeks, Jesus is marching resolutely towards Jerusalem, towards his ultimate goal. Jericho, like I said, was not far from where he was tempted, and it's not that far from where he will ultimately be sacrificed. But this doesn't answer the problem of the two beggars of Matthew. We have to understand Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience. Mark and Luke were likely writing to Gentiles. And so what Matthew does, we see Matthew do this earlier, whenever he talks about the demoniac, he mentions two, and yet Mark and Luke will mention only one. Why? Why do they do this? Well, it's likely Mark and Luke are using the one character that the Gentile church would be familiar with. They have likely heard of Bartimaeus, or they have met Bartimaeus. Our text makes it very clear. He becomes a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And so that's why when you read the gospel occurrences, there are differences. Matthew is telling the Jewish audience there were two to emphasize Jesus' healing power and his divinity. Because only God, if you know the Old Testament, only God brings sight to the blind. So Jesus does this. And then we, we move on, okay? This man named Bartimaeus. Mark and Luke, like I said, they know the people who are reading their letters, their gospel, they likely know who he is. But his name is very interesting itself, Bar Timaeus. Now, last week I talked about Jesus saying to Peter in John 1.42, you are Simon Bar Jonah, is how I think the King James words it, and, and some translations do, but Modern translations say you are Simon, son of John, because bar is an Aramaic word that typically means from or in the context, the son of somebody. So what's that tell us about Bartimaeus? He doesn't have a first name. He is a nameless man known only by who his father is. In fact, throughout the rest of the New Testament, we're not going to see his name come back up, at least not as Bartimaeus. Now, Timaeus, his father's name, it means to be honored or respected. So that would, include, that would indicate to us that Bartimaeus was a man who had big shoes to fill. That he had a reputation, a legacy to live up to, and yet he is blind. He's a beggar. Bartimaeus is, for all accounts, a failure in his life. He's this faceless, nameless, nobody. And church, when we really begin to think about that, was that not truly also us? We're no better than beggars hoping for crumbs. Now you might say, oh, Pastor Jeff, that's a little extreme. I did okay. I wasn't, you know, the richest guy in the world, but I, I could pay my bills. I wasn't a beggar living on the side of the street. I'm not talking about monetary beggars. Before Christ, we did not have the wholeness. We wanted crumbs from the bread of life. But it's not until we have the bread of life in our, li in our lives that we truly understand and come to understand that all that time before Christ, we were enjoying crumbs of joy, crumbs of love, crumbs of mercy, and crumbs of wholeness. But when we have tasted the bread of life that is Jesus, we receive true love, true joy, true grace, true mercy, true wholeness. 
This is what blind men did. This is what beggars did. They, they couldn't work, so they would position themselves along the main roads and they would beg for loose change, for alms, for anything spare. And church, I don't want you to miss this. I don't want you to misunderstand this. Timaeus, uh, Bartimaeus is sitting at the side of the road. Jesus has walked past him. Jesus did not initially stop for this man. Jesus is focused on his goal, but he saw plenty of beggars by the side of the street, plenty of lame people who did not get healed that day. He walked right past Bartimaeus. This tells us a couple of things. One, Jesus was not taking side streets. Jesus was, like I said, resolutely marching towards his ultimate goal. But it also tells us something about this beggar. Because he's clearly nothing special standing out in the crowd. And Jesus just keeps walking, keeps going. But, but, read verse 47 with me. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. When he heard who had just breezed past him, how did he hear? The crowd, the followers of Jesus. Church men only need to hear. The parable of the sower, Mark chapter 4, we, we read that. We just need to plant the seed and let the Holy Spirit work. Let the Holy Spirit do his job. Paul says in Romans 10, how will they call on him in whom they have not heard? How will they believe in whom they have not, I'm sorry, how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? Jesus doesn't stop. It's the crowd who's talking about the one leading them that brings him into knowing who Jesus is. That's us. That's that's our role as Christians. That's our role as followers of Christ, to be talking about Jesus in order to be heard. And he overhears the crowd. He overhears their murmuring. Jesus is walking too fast for me today, right? As Jesus of Nazareth, I'm, I mean, he's a good teacher and everything, but he's going quick. Or maybe they're saying, you know what? I know what he's doing. He's heading to Jerusalem. And he's going to become, he's going to set himself up as the king. He's the Messiah. He's this, he's that. And something inside Bartimaeus snaps. Something inside this broken man breaks. And he begins to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And it's the first time in the gospel of Mark, it's the first time he's called the son of David. This is a clear and complete messianic term. This is Bartimaeus saying and establishing, I know who you are. I know who you really are. He heard Jesus the Nazarene. He heard Jesus of Nazareth, but he cries out, Jesus, son of David. This is an Old Testament Word. This is Old Testament thinking. This is Old Testament Jewish ways of considering the Messiah. Isaiah calls him the son of David. Jeremiah calls him the son of David. Ezekiel calls him the son of David. Because the idea was God was going to raise up from the house of David a true ruler over Israel. And he is the only hope the nation has. But he's not just the hope for the nation of Israel. Though the Messiah was who Israel had hoped for, he's also the very hope of every individual life. Bartimaeus does not just see this man, Jesus of Nazareth, as a warlord come to break off the shackles of Rome. He doesn't see him as some kind of gangster who's going to use anarchy to overthrow the government. 
He doesn't see him as a general set to conquer. He sees him as a Messiah of mercy. And so he cries out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And verse 48 reads, And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Church Bartimaeus is pitifully aware of who he is. Do not have any illusions about that. He knows his conditions. He knows what he looks like. Likely unshaven, unkempt. He, what good would a mirror do for a blind man to be able to comb his hair? How dirty he must have been. How he might have smelled. And yet, he calls out, and the wording tells us that he, he likely sounded unhinged, crazy, desperate. And the crowd, much like oftentimes the modern church, tries to hush him, to quiet him. You don't really fit in with us, Bartimaeus. You don't really look like us. And many times we are very much like the crowd. Now, there's a time for discussion about sanctification, about church uh, behaviors, right? There's a time for spiritual maturity, a time for, for the talk about growth and just good manners at times for some people. But too often we rush to assimilate people with calloused hands and calloused hearts. And that's what happens when many people will say, well, well, the church talks about love, but then they push everybody away. Well, they become bitter. They become angry at the church. Bartimaeus shows he's not like that. He has the heart of a true seeker. He has the heart of someone who's not deterred by the crowd. He's not let down by the mistakes of men. He continues to pursue Jesus even when the crowd around him has failed him. And he, he knows who Jesus is, so he kept crying out all the more. The Greek there for crying out, is its root is krazo. I'll let you guess what modern English word comes from that. The, the tense here is ekrazen. It means he continued screaming. He continued shrieking. He continued bellowing out. This is the desperate cry of an unwhole heart yearning to be made right. He doesn't just want to receive his sight. This is a soul pleading for the Messiah's mercy. And the crowd's reaction kind of makes sense. It starts to fill in some blanks because he, he likely does sound uncouth, uncivilized, unhinged. The wording is actually very similar to that of what we saw back in chapter 5 with the Gerasene demoniac who would gash himself with rocks, cut himself with stones, and scream and shriek and a crazen is the Greek. To the point everybody in the surrounding villages were very uncomfortable because of his shrieking and screaming and calling out. In fact, Matthew actually uses the same word in the story of the Syrophoenician mother with the, the, who had the, the daughter who was demon-possessed. The disciples come to Jesus and they literally say, send her away, she's sounding crazy to us. She won't stop shrieking, she won't stop a crazy, she won't stop yelling at us. It's the desperate cry of a heart that needs the Messiah's mercy. And yet those who understand this, those who are in desperate need of the Messiah's mercy, they understand that it's worth offending the crowd. It's worth being considered crazy, losing friends or neighbors, worth abandoning everything because in the Messiah's mercy, we find the only place we can truly be made whole. But here, in this moment, the plea of this man grips the Savior's heart. And he stops. I missed a spot in my notes. <laughs> he stops. That's what verse 48 tells us. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. 
And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. Well, I am all over my notes here. I'm at verse 49. Wow. Sorry, sorry. If you're watching online, this doesn't normally happen. Verse 49, Jesus stops. Church, when's the last time that our prayer life made Jesus stop? When's the last time we prayed and pled so passionately? I got to tell you, I got to be honest with you. When I was doing this sermon preparation, I, I hit this and it hit me. And I, I just had to stop and I was praying. Lord, when's the last time I prayed in a way to provoke you to stop and listen? When's the last time I prayed with such desperation, such passion? You know, when James and John approached Jesus, they had to run to catch up to him with their request. When Jesus had set out initially, the rich young ruler has to run up to him to catch up to Jesus. And Jesus stops with James and John, but he stops to correct. With the rich young ruler, he stops to teach. Here he stops to call the man to himself. Church, like ask you again, when have we prayed with such desperation? When have we wanted him to touch and to heal so badly? When have we cared so much? We called out so passionately and we heard him say, get over here. Come into my presence. I would tell you that is where true revival begins. Where true revival starts in our heart. When we see the way we are, our own sin, our own brokenness, and we call out, Messiah, show me your mercy. It's the kind of prayer life that will put you in the lion's den with Daniel. He'll get you thrown out of Potiphar's house with Joseph. It'll force you to run and hide in caves alongside David so you can avoid the wrath of the mad king. But it closes the lion's mouth. It's also the same type of prayer life that gets Pharaoh to hear your name, to bring the shepherd boy into the throne room. And I'm not saying we are Daniel. I'm not saying we are David or, or Joseph or even Bartimaeus, but they are examples for us. They are examples of what we could be, examples of what we have been at times. And if your prayer life is dull and meaningless to you, why should we expect it to be anything but dull and meaningless to Christ? If it's just a habit, if it's just a ritual, if it's just a religious thing that we have to do to tick a box, to check a box and say, well, I prayed today. It's not a prayer life that is truly from your heart. It's not a call out to the Messiah. You understand there were plenty of blind beggars in Israel. I said this earlier. But it's this man who pleads and Jesus stops. And one of the most beautiful things about Jesus' ministry on earth is when he sees the suffering or hears the suffering calling out to him, those who come to him in faith, those who come to him in need, he stops. And he takes time. Whether it's Jairus, whose daughter is dying, whether it's the woman with the issue of blood, whether it's a blind man calling out, Son of David, hear me and heal me. Jesus takes the time. He says, call him here. Now, church, think about this for a second. Bartimaeus is blind. You think Jesus is telling him, Hey, Bartimaeus, listen for the sound of my voice and come find me. This will be a fun game. No. He tells the crowd, essentially what he is saying is, you go get him. And in that moment, those who had rebuked him are now escorting him to the master. Those who had rebuked him are now taking him to the teacher. Those who rebuked him are now ushering him into the Savior's presence. This is Jesus actually softly rebuking them for trying to silence him. So they call to him. They say, take courage, get up. He's calling for you. The wording there, take courage, it's only one word in the Greek. It's the word tharse, and it's only used seven times in the New Testament. Jesus tells the disciples in John 16, 13, he uses this very word. He says, 
I've spoken these things to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. When Paul is stranded at sea and there's no hope, the Lord stands by his side in Acts 23. The Lord stands by his side and says, take courage, Tharse. The King James translates it as be of good comfort. The NIV says, take heart. One commentator said it could also be translated, cheer up. Because there's cheer. There is joy in knowing that the Messiah is listening and now you have his attention. The one you've called out to has heard you and there is joy, cheer to be had. Cheer up, rise up. He's calling for you. The Messiah has stopped. Now, Bartimaeus, get up. Let's go. You're going to get what you want. You're going to have an audience with the king. The king has stopped and he's heard you. He's heard the cry of your heart. And we read in verse 50, And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. I know a lot of pastors have talked about this in the past. Throwing off his cloak. And we read that and we'll say, oh, he gave up so much that day. No, he did not. He gave up everything. He didn't just give up a piece of cloth. Jewish law, by the way, had things in it concerning your cloak. In the book of Exodus, if you borrowed a man's cloak, you had to return it before sunset because he may not have anything else to cover himself with when the night gets cold. If you were a creditor and you had to take everything from somebody who owed you money, Deuteronomy 24 says the one thing you could not take was a man's cloak. For a beggar in first century Palestine, this was literally all he owned. This was the clothes on his back. This cloak was his home. It was his blanket. It was his everything. It was the only thing in his life that had ever done anything for him. You understand whenever a beggar had his hands out, he had his cloak in his hands and you would drop the coins in it. And if it once that little area of fabric was full, he would tie it together, he'd move on to another strip of cloth. This was his piggy bank. This is what he had to store everything he owned in. Bartimaeus, when he stands up that day and he casts off his cloak, you understand he is leaving his clothing behind. He is leaving his home behind. He is leaving his bank account behind. He is leaving every single thing he had behind. He is forsaking his entire world. He's renouncing it all in order to get to Jesus. Where have we heard that before? Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus ultimately says, go, sell everything you own, give to the poor, and then come follow me. You'll have treasures in heaven. And the guy leaves broken and upset because he had many things. He owned much property. And here we see a man who is broken and upset. He has nothing and he casts it away to come to the Savior. He gives up everything. Could be argued Bartimaeus lived it deeper than this young man, than the rich young ruler could have. He was physically disabled. He had no ability to work and regain any money should this not work out. He had no power should this not work out to utilize, to reestablish himself. He was already poor. He had no savings, no anything else that he could barter, trade, or sell. And he's blind. He's not going to come back and find that cloak after everything's said and done if Jesus doesn't heal him. You understand, for Bartimaeus, there was no plan B. This had to work. On top of that, he had no reputation of his own. Remember his name, Bartimaeus. He only had his father's name, which clearly had not gotten him very far. Peter said, Lord, we left everything and followed you, back in verse 28. Now so has Bartimaeus. Christ's mercy cost him everything. 
and he willingly casts it aside. We read in verse 51, And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. This is the sad part of this whole passage to me. You understand that in this moment, this pitiful man comes before Jesus and Jesus asks him the same exact question he'd asked two of his disciples not that long ago. What do you want me to do for you? And this man who had nothing, this man who had just heard about Jesus from the crowd, this man who had just cried out to Jesus, comes to him and just says, I just want to regain my sight. He wasn't always blind. He just wants to recover something that was lost. You see, when James and John come to Jesus, they want elevation. They want satisfaction. They want authority. They want power. They want glory. Bartimaeus says, I don't deserve anything. I just want your mercy, son of David. And if it's possible, I'd like for you to restore my sight. One thing he'd lost that he wanted back. And while the translation we're reading from today says rabbi, the actual word is rabboni or chraboni. It's a Hebrew word and it means my teacher. Mary uses the same word in John whenever she sees the resurrected Christ and she, she understands who he is. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, chraboni, which means teacher. John translates that for us. Luke tells us Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus also calls him Lord, meaning master. Bartimaeus truly has a grasp of who Jesus is. He calls him the Messiah. He calls him teacher and Lord and master. And yet in spite of all of that, in this moment, Jesus, in a beautiful way, he takes on the role of a servant. You see, servants don't, or leaders, masters, lords, they don't say, what do you want me to do for you? Servants say that. Slaves say that. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus models for us, once again, compassion, empathy, what it looks like to be last, what it looks like to be low, uh, low what it looks like to be a servant, showing kindness, showing grace, and above all, showing his mercy. In verse 52, Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Matthew tells us that Jesus is stirred with compassion for the man and that he touches him to heal him. Jesus touches him. So many times, Jesus' touch heals, it cleanses, it sets things right. And in this moment, he touches this man and new eyes inside the sockets are formed. New tissues are reformed, I'm sorry, damaged tissues are reformed. Synapses in his brain from his eyes are transformed and so is his heart. He says, go your way. Some translations just say go. If we really read this word there and the, the way Jesus is using this, it's actually very tender. Many times when he says this, it's go away. But the tenderness and the, the tense of the way he uses it here, it would almost be as though he was saying, now off you go. I found that beautiful. Because if you don't know this, I have a small son who's about three years old, and sometimes he comes to me with these huge tears streaming down his neck, or down his che cheeks onto his neck, all the way, all over himself, snotting and everything, and he says, Daddy, that, that person hurt my feelings, whether it's a sister or a friend or mommy, you know. <laughs> mommy hurt my feelings. And he comes and he just wants to cry, and he just wants to be held, and he just wants to be loved. Sometimes he gets hurt. Sometimes he falls down and bangs his knee or hurts his arm and he just wants to be held. And when I, 
Stand him up, off you go. And he runs along. And in this moment, we see Jesus truly as the good shepherd who has mended a sheep. And he puts him back on his feet and says, now off you go. And he doesn't just say, in, in the ESV, it says, your faith has made you well. But really, the, the terminology, the wording there is, your faith has saved you. I know the NIV and some translations say your faith has healed you, and it had, but his faith had something deeper, something greater. There was a bigger impact here. It saved him. There's another Greek word used for physical healing. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus uses a word that says, you have been made whole. You have been saved. You have been made right. In other words, restore his sight, absolutely. But his very soul has been saved. And we understand Paul's wording when he says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. His faith delivered him. His faith saved him. On top of all of that, Bartimaeus is no longer blind Bartimaeus. Sometimes you read in your Bible, the parakopi, the little title, it says, Jesus, even in my Bible, it says, Jesus heals blind Bartimaeus. Well, if he's healed, he's no longer blind. Praise God, now he can see. And this beggar, this man who had nothing, now he follows. Jesus tells him, go your way. And his way is now the same way Christ is going. He follows Jesus. In fact, when we look at the, the Gospel of Luke and his account, Luke writes, immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. You see, his understanding of who Jesus was, his grasp of who Jesus was, led to a life change that changed how he worshipped that changed how he lived, that changed the direction of his life. And from there, other people saw it, and it changed their worship. It impacted how they saw Jesus, how they glorified him. A few weeks ago, I said, your theology is reflected in your doxology. What you believe about God is reflected in how you worship God. And Bartimaeus is a perfect example to us of what that looks like. Bartimaeus got who Jesus was. And even though he was blind, he saw how Jesus worked. And when he cried out, he feels the touch of Jesus' hands and it brings him to worship. And the crowd worships with him. That is the result of a life that has felt the mercy of Christ. That is the result of a life that seeks to know Christ. That's the result of a life that worships Christ. This is what we should all aspire to. This is what we should all want to become. A life willing to lose it all for the mercy of Christ. Just to stop and have him hear our plea and say, your faith has saved you. Another way he will say it to many of us, hopefully, some of us at least, will be, well done, good and faithful servant. This is the heart of someone who truly seeks the Messiah. I'm going to move to close in just a moment. I'm going to ask uh, Patty to come back and play. And, and we're going to sing one more song in closing. And I'll dismiss us in prayer. And I'll say again, mercy is a powerful thing, but it is too often forgotten. And though it's forgotten, it is needed. Were it not for God's mercy, there would be no salvation. And yet, though we don't deserve it, God gives it freely when we are willing to ask for it. And if you're watching online or you're here today, I would ask you, do you need his mercy? Have you not called out to Christ to be your Savior? And if you have... And I would ask you, has his mercy changed you? Has it, has it affected your life? Has it brought you to worship? And if it hasn't, you need to cry out to him again. Father, this morning, I know we're going we're gonna to sing and we're going to worship and we're going to 
close, but Lord, I just pray you are glorified. You are a God of mercy. And I pray that as we see you and get a better glimpse of you, our worship is also changed. That others see our worship, that others see your work in our life, and that you be glorified. Amen. Be As we close this morning, I would ask you if Jesus Christ is your Lord. If he's not, please be willing to reach out via Facebook, email, whatever. We'd be, we would love to pray with you, pray for you. Next week we'll have...